I don't think that I'm the only one that has uh, said this to themselves in the last couple of years, but really in the last two or three years, I've said to myself over and over and over again, I never thought I'd see the day. You know what I'm talking about? I just, I just never thought I'd see the day when I see a culture that was so messed up. I never thought I'd see the day when the world was so confused. Uh, and you think that's a horrible introduction to Mother's Day. But I, I gotta say, our, our world does not know what motherhood is. Our world does not know who women are. They, 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 don't, they don't know what bathroom to go to. They don't know what gender they are. You know, our, our world is totally, totally messed up. And uh, our world is at the point where, sure, well, they'll let a guy go into a school and, uh, and dressed in drag and read kids what they say is a childhood story, but you let a parent want to go to that same school and read a Bible story, they won't let them do that. Is that messed up? Is that wrong? There's something you know, crazy about that. You know, our culture does not believe in truth. Oh, I think it back, I think it back. What our culture believes in is that truth is whatever you want it to be. Okay, truth is whatever you want it to be. Now, I, I know that they apply that only to certain things, but uh, they say, you know, truth is whatever you, you want it to be. If, you, if, you're, if you're a male and you want to be a woman, just decide you're going to be a woman, and you are. That's, you know, so there's something wrong up here Amen. for that to be. There's something wrong in here, you know, for that to be, you know, in the case. And I'll be honest with you, I'm grateful that, that, that we have truth. I'm grateful that we have the truth, and I'm grateful that we can teach it, and we can preach it, and we can learn it, we can study it, that we can take our Bibles home, and we can read, and we can you know, comprehend what God is trying to say to us, because I'm, I'm grateful for God's Word, I'm grateful for the Bible, and uh, uh, we can build our lives on truth, we can build our homes on truth, we can build our churches on truth, and as I understand American history, uh, this nation was built upon truth. And it, it, one of the greatest nations that ever was, uh, you know, built upon truth. And, and so today I'm, I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to look at truth. And, and I'm going to take some time as we acknowledge Mother's Day. We're going to deal with a passage that it deals with motherhood and fatherhood and childhood. Because I'm going to take a look at a passage out of Colossians chapter 3 that talks to us about some basics in building a solid family. Now I know last Sunday I started a series through the book of Colossians. We got into about the first few verses of uh, chapter 1 and I thought on, on Mother's Day I just felt like it would be important for us to take some time to see what this little book has to say to us about the home. Now I'll, I'll tell you right up front, uh, there, there are a couple of problems you know, with, with Mother's Day. Uh, and one of them is, it's, it's not something that we're commanded to do in Scripture. It's, it's a great idea. It's a great thing for us to do. Nowhere are we commanded to honor mothers or fathers or children on their special day. But I will tell you this, woe be to the preacher that on Mother's Day talks about stewardship and not mothers. Amen. Right? <laughs> You got it. I mean, and it's good for us to take some time to look at the word and see what it has to say, has to, say to us. And, and also, you know, to whom do uh, we direct, you know, Mother's Day remarks to? I mean, who, who am I to talk to today? Am I to tell women how to be a better mother? I think I'd be walking off that nice to do that. <laughs> do I direct my words to the fathers and to the to the men of the home and to the children? Uh, well, I, let's just let the word speak for itself. And I want us to take a look at some verses out of uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, that talk to us about just some basics of building a, a solid home. Uh, a Christian counselor that, that lived within our lifetime, his name is Jay Adams, he's known as the father of uh, uh, Christian counseling. And he said this, he said, a Christian home is a place where sinners live. They know they're sinners. And they know what to do with sin. You see, Christian home is not a place where the people are perfect. I mean, we, we know that. I mean, we want, we want to honor Christ in our home, but it's not a place where people are perfect. But it is a place where we know we are imperfect, that we sin, and that we need grace, 
and we get that grace in Christ and then that we give it to other people as well. So with, with that in mind, let, let's take a look at uh, this passage together. Read with me from uh, Colossians chapter three, verses 18 through, through 20. Now my reference says verse 21, we'll get to that in just a few minutes, but, but read along with me. Colossians 3, verse 18. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Those three verses talk to you know, mothers, fathers, and, and children. And the first thing it says right out of the gate is wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, isn't that great? Mother's Day, first thing comes out of the preacher's mouth is women submit. Our culture does not like that word. Maybe you don't like that word. Maybe we don't like that word. But the truth is, our, our nature, we sort of rile up inside and we're told, we're taught that we need to submit to, to anybody. In fact, there are probably few words that elicit more negative responses from us on the inside than to be told that we need to submit. I, I believe with this particular verse and a matching verse over in the book of Ephesians, that when it says, you know, the wives submit to the husbands as to the Lord, that we sort of envision, you know, to what, what is thought of has happened in caveman days, where the caveman's walking along and he's dragging his wife by the hair behind him. That's not what this is talking about. That, that is not what this is talking about at all. As a matter of fact, this verse and the verse in Ephesians, as a matter of fact, let's just take a look at that, that verse in Ephesians. Turn back a couple of pages. Ephesians chapter Let's see, it's chapter 4, I believe it is. I made a mistake when I just did this with that. Check here, it's, it's Ephesians 5, verse 22. And it says, Wives, submit to your husband as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And then he goes on further and says, Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. But it's, it's those verses, Colossians and Ephesians, that people look at and they say, Wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul, was a chauvinist. He was just a male chauvinist. Not only that, they'll look at those verses and they'll say, that is where women began to be discriminated through the church and the scripture. I gotta tell you, that is all wrong. For people to come to that conclusion, what they have done is they've taken Christianity out of its historical, historical context and they've given it a whole different meaning. Actually, in the first century, when the Apostle Paul said, you know, wives, you know, submit to the husbands. He was actually elevating women because women were never even considered important in that culture in that day. They were, were considered property. The husband could dismiss his wife. He could do away with his wife for any reason. She didn't have a meal on the table when he thought it ought to be as grounds for divorce. Now, she didn't have any reason to divorce him, but in the first century, the culture had it. Women, you are property. And here the Apostle Paul makes it very plain that the woman is, is not property. She's part of the home. And uh, uh, she was, had a, a valuable place within that union and within that home. And that's why verses have to say, husband, love your wives. Don't be harsh with them. And then further, in Christ, there is no male and, and female. Uh, it, this was really a revolutionary thought in the first century. And so today, for people to say, see, the church is all about keeping their thumb on women. No, it's not. These verses and the ministry of Jesus, if it did anything, it elevated and lifted up you know, women. Now, I, I want you to notice two things that, uh, that I see here in, in this passage. It says, submit as is fitting to the Lord. Now, what does that mean? You're married to a man that uh, wants to lead the home into an immoral lifestyle or with one that is demanding that you do things that are wrong and that are sinful and that are uh, against the, the, the will of God, the standard of God. Uh, according to my understanding of the scripture, submission is not a part of the picture at that point. And I also understand that there are men that are, are beaters physical abusers, whether it be physically or, or emotionally or verbally, the wife is certainly not obligated to follow those men in that lifestyle. 
But see, submission is a very important part of every person that's mentioned in our verses today. We'll find out that the women are to be submissive, the men were to be submissive, and the children are, are to be submissive. So it is talking about women as is fitting to the Lord. And if you are being led into a lifestyle that is contrary to God's standard, you have a reason to back away from that and say, no, I am not going to do that. But also, there's something else I want you to see about this verse, and, and don't understand, don't misunderstand me on this. He's talking to wives specifically, not women in general. Now, but what in the world do you mean by that? In the Old Testament, there's a woman by the name of Deborah. She was a, she was a leader. She was a judge of God's people in the Old Testament. In Romans chapter 16, you read of a woman by the name of Phoebe. She was a leader within the church. She was a servant in the church. There are times, there are times when women are in leadership roles, whether it be a governor of the state, whether it be a police woman, whether it be uh, any of the things that, I, that I've mentioned here, here so far, that uh, the women are to be in leadership. And when they are, guys, it may go against our male ego, but we have a responsibility to submit to them. Is that not right? Some of you are mighty quiet this morning. <laughs> maybe guys, you're hesitant to say anything, and maybe women, you are too. But the truth is, you know, there are roles that women are, are to have in, in roles of leadership, and when they do have them, we are to, to submit to them. Now, when it, but then if that woman chooses to be married, this verse, God's word says, that submit to the husband. Now that does not mean that the husband is a dictator. Neither does it mean the wife is a doormat. It means that he loves her as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her and she is willing to follow him in that. In any institution, there is a line of authority, we know that, whether it be the military, whether it be the government, whether it be the household, whether it be local government, the police force, fire department, whatever it is, there is a line of authority and we understand that and we are to be people that submit to that and we are to respect that. And, um, and so he says here, women, Wives, submit to, to your husband. Now let, let's move on and talk about the other part here in Colossians chapter 3. We could go on and spend a lot of time in each of those verses, but I'm not going to do that. I want us just to cover the basics of it because that's all we're doing today, just talking about some of the basics. And then it says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. I've met men over the years, Christian men over the years, that felt like that. I'm the head of the home, I'm the boss. When I speak, people are to jump. I've had men in Sunday school class say, hey look, I expect when I get home, dinner to be on the table, and I can bring company home without notifying her, and she ought to be okay with that. How many of you are in favor of that? How many of you think that's kind of crazy? Going, okay, good, good. Getting some participation there, you understand. Yeah, I, I do too, I think, God, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? You're thinking because you're the man, you can do what you want, you're gonna keep your thumb on her and think, no, it says, men, love your wives, do not be harsh with them. Um, actually, it's a heavy responsibility to be the leader because actually what's happening here is the, is the man is not concerned about being the boss, but it's concerned about him giving of himself to sacrifice for the family, to provide for their needs, and to see that everything is, is taken care of that he is responsible to, to do. Does that make sense? So, so men, be the head of home and says, do not be harsh. Uh, and in the 45 years that, that plus that I've been in ministry, I have seen several situations where there have been battered wives' homes where women had nowhere else to go but to get away from an abusive situation. And I, I've understood that there have been situations that, as I mentioned, the husband would be abusive simply because dinner wasn't on the table when he expected it to be, or it wasn't prepared the way he expected it to be. Uh, and uh, told of wives that were not, not allowed to get out of the house. He kept her in the house, kept her out of social groups where she could make friends and things of that nature. And basically guys that are like that, let's just say what it is, that's abusive. Is that not right? That, 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 that's, that's abusive. And we can be abusive in several ways. We can be abusive physically.
Let, let me just say this, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. A man ought never to strike the woman. Amen? Amen. Let never strike the woman. Never be physically abusive. But we can also be abusive verbally, emotionally, by what we say and how we treat them. And 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7 says, love always protects. Husbands, if you're to love the wife, one of the roles we have is we are to always protect her as best as we can. We take it. That's where Adam blew it in the garden when, when Adam and Eve fell on that day, when they ate of that forbidden fruit. And you know, sure, Eve was the one that took a bite of the, the fruit first, but where was Adam? Why didn't he step up and say, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Why didn't he do that? He failed his wife. He failed God. He failed all of us in doing it. And just go back here to Colossians chapter 3. Husbands, love your wives. You're your wife. Let me take there, there are no qualifiers here. And when I say no qualifiers, here's what I mean. There is none of this stuff. I love you if. I love you if you make me feel good. I love you if you do this for me. I love you if you go here for me. Not, not I love you because of what you do. I do think not that I say I love you because of uh, uh, what you do for me. It's I love you, period. That's the same way God loves us. And then, what did that verse in Ephesians say a minute ago that I quoted? You know, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And here in this passage, we're told in Colossians, husbands, love your wives. Don't, your wife, don't be harsh. And we're to love our wife as Christ loved the church. And, and quite honestly, in my lifetime, and maybe I, I will be song in the future, but, but in my lifetime, I have never met a Christian woman that was not willing to submit to and follow her Christian husband who she knew in the bottom of her heart that he would die for her and lay down his life for her and he was surrendering his own will in an effort to serve her and to serve the family. Does that picture come pretty clear to you? Does that make sense? So husbands, love, love your wives. And uh, we're not talking about uh, a feeling here. We're talking about a commitment that I love you, period. Now, guys, I understand <laughs> we have difficulty taking hints. Any guys here have difficulty catching hints? No honesty here? Okay, my wife told me years ago, but you can't take a hint. Sometimes to get my attention, you have to hit, my, hit me over the head with a two before. And then you got my attention. But, guys, let me just give you some clues and uh, maybe some tangible ways you can express love to your wife. And, and I'll quickly mention these. Not going to go into great detail, but I'll just quickly mention these. And uh, you might want to jot down a note or two uh, along the way. And I say this because otherwise, if you don't, she will hand you the notes later. Okay, so go ahead and take a couple notes. First thing, tangible way to express love to your wife, verbalize it. Tell her, I love you. Tell her, you're special to me. Don't be like the guy that said, hey, look, I told you on our wedding day I love you, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. No, 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 no. Say it every day, multiple times, I love you. You mean a lot to me. Tell her, thank you. Thank her for what she means, means to you. And when we become emotionally vulnerable by expressing that, all that does is deepen the relationship that we have. Doesn't jeopardize it whatsoever at all. Second thing, touch. There was a well-known columnist some time ago asked, if you had a chance, if you had a choice, would you prefer intimacy in marriage or a warm hug? 70% of the women that responded said, you know, I would take this, the, the warm hug. I would take the touch. The touch of an arm on my shoulder, an arm around my waist, holding my hand, a quick kiss, a short hug. I, I would take that because guys, so often we've forgotten all about that, that little tender touch. And by the way, the kids 
and the grandkids need to see that as well. Now, this happened probably, you know, it's over, over 30 years ago in our home, but it, so it's been a while. It's when our two boys were still at home growing up. There, there was one day, Brian and Stephen were in the house, they were playing, they were kind of loud and, and raucous in, in the house, running around a little bit, and that was okay. I was in the kitchen helping Sally, you know, get some dinner things ready, and, and I stepped up behind her, put my arms on her shoulder, and kissed, kissed her on the neck, and about that time, one of the boys came running in the kitchen, and he saw us and embraced her, and, and he said, ooh! And he turned around and, ran, and ran off. <laughs> Years later, in the home where we currently live, it was over holiday time, and that same son was home with his wife and his children, and we were in the kitchen getting some meals together, and he went walking by his wife and sort of patted her behind a little bit, and she smacked his hand and said, she called him by name, and said, no, your parents are going to see that. He said, I was pleased he said this. He said, where do you think I learned that? <laughs> the touch is important. And the kids need to see it because they need the security to know that mom and dad love one another. Amen? Amen. They need to see it. They need to feel it. They need, need to know it. Uh, another thing we do is we need to listen. Listen to the wife. Listen to your wife. Remember the days back in the early days, maybe a long time ago, when you know she would talk and we would listen. We would listen to everything about the background, where she's from, where she grew up, who they knew, the relatives, the likes and dislikes and stuff like that. I, I will be honest though, the longer we're living together, the more I'm finding out that we still don't know a lot about one another. But you, you remember back in those days, I mean, whenever she talked, we, we would listen, we would listen, we would listen. Recently, I heard a woman say this. She said, whenever I am told not to tell a secret, I immediately go and tell my husband because I know he doesn't listen to me. <laughs> Maybe there's a bit of wisdom in that, I don't know, but hey, let's, uh, let's, let's listen you know, to, our, to our wife. Uh, one of our favorite ministries over the year over the years has been a ministry by the name of Focus on the Family back in the, in the late 1970s. So we're talking a long time ago when Dr. James Dobson founded that, that ministry. Um, he, it, it started out small, but it, it grew and it built up. And, and they had this 30 minute radio program every day. Plus they put out booklets and magazines and, and film strips and things of, of that nature. But uh, Dobson one day, when I was listening to his 30 minute radio program in the mornings, he was talking to us guys, how to prepare to go home after work at the end of the day. He said, because a lot of us, we take the baggage with us home from work. And he said, guys, here's what you gotta do. He said, you gotta find a place somewhere between the time you, you leave the office or the time you clock out to the time that you get home where you hang all the problems of the day on a nail whether it's a real nail or an imaginary one or what, but you lay it all right there on that nail. And from that point on, you prepare your mind and your heart for the people that are under the roof you call home. And then he said something that really just rung a bell in my mind. He said, because at the end of the day, we go home to do the most important work of the day. You ever heard that before? Amen. Yeah, yeah. It is absolutely true. <clears throat> Our most important work of the day is not that day job. Yeah, it provides for the family. It does, we do provide for the family, and we're grateful to do that. But when we go home and walk in that door, that's when we're going home to do the most important work of the day, to love your wife and to love your children. See that verse 21 in Colossians 3? Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Don't be harsh. Love them. Play with them. Watch them grow up. Help them grow up. And it, it happens when we listen. And then that, and that leads us right into the next one here. Spend time together alone. Now, I was talking specifically here with, with your wife. Um, and the reason this is important is, is this. As time passes, we change. As time passes, we change. 
Are you the same person you were a year ago? Are you the same person you were five years ago? Am I the same person I was 10 years ago? Uh, I guarantee you, you have changed. I guarantee you, your spouse has changed. I guarantee you, your children have changed. And one of the things I've noticed over the years, among many things I've noticed, is very often as children grow up and they graduate from high school, graduate from college, and they go out on their own, very often there's this thing, it's called the, the empty nest syndrome. You heard of that? Too often, when the empty nest syndrome happens, the two adults left in the home, they're strangers because they have not talked, they have not listened, they have not spent time alone together. So spend time together. Then also be sensitive to hurts. Um, I had to grow up a lot on that one. There were a lot of times in the early days, Sally tried to say, well, I feel this way, and my first response was, well, that's dumb. Where did that rate on the sensitivity scale? Zero? Yeah. yeah I've come to realize, no, 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 no. I'm not helping the situation when I do that. i got to understand how she feels. got to understand what's going on in, in her mind. Now, you notice she's not here today, at least in this room. She's in the next room teaching the kids. But I assure you, she's going to listen to this after church today, and I'll hear about it. But be sensitive to the hurts of your spouse and, and, and listen. And then also put her on a pedestal. Let her know she is special. Several years ago, I heard about a preacher down in Atlanta that uh, uh, one Sunday, it was a rather large church, and one Sunday after church, he was in his office watching the congregation get in their cars as they left and, and were heading home. And he said this, he said, you know, out, out of all the thousands of marriage counseling sessions I have had, I have never had a couple come into my office where he opens and closes the door for her. Be sensitive. Put her on a pedestal. Let her know she's special. Okay, we're moving on here. Got one, one more part to deal with here where the Apostle Paul says, he says, wives, you know, submit to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives. And then we come to verse 20. It says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. I don't know if you noticed it, but there's a common theme that goes through all these verses, and it's the word submission. Wives, Submit. Husbands, you love, but your love causes you to submit. And children, you submit to your family, to your parents as well. By the way, I think one of the most important character traits parents can help develop in their children is, is submission. And that's just the opposite of what we face in the world today. Because what we face in the world today, very often, parents are saying, no, 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 I want my child to have a strong self-image. I want them to feel good about themselves. I want them, I don't want them to be uh, harassed or limited in anything they do. I do not correct my child. I let them make their own decisions about everything they want to face. And here's what happens as a result of that. Our culture's way, and I should have put this on, on, the, on the image here, on the left, that is birth, okay? And then as we go to the right, that is maturing or when they're on their own. But very often, parents will say, I am not going to restrict my kids at all. I'm not going to give them any rules whatsoever. And if they can do what they want to do. They can figure out for themselves what is right. Now, that has been the ruling philosophy in our country in the last 50 years or more. And the homes of our country are a disaster. Because what happens is as the kids do what they want to do and do everything they want to do and nobody tells them what to do and, and parents, as time goes on, they start to become more restrictive. You see, then those arrows are getting closer and closer. They become more restrictive. And what happens when you try to restrict somebody that's been able to do whatever they wanted to do? Man, I tell you, you have fights. You have heat. You have war. And so what happens? The parent restricts more and more and more and more. And you have a disaster. Parents hating their kids, kids hating their parents because mom and dad had it wrong here. They thought it was their role to raise kids to feel good about themselves and let them determine for themselves what is right, that they could have a good, healthy self-image. God wants them to have a submissive heart. But God's way is this next one. Oh, go ahead and back up again. Yeah, there you go. God's way is, is this. 
God's way is, from the time that they are young, they know what the ground rules are. They know that, and they know when they break those ground rules, there are consequences to pay. You know, it is a horrible thing when a house is ruled by a toddler. You ever seen it? We don't say anything about it, but we've seen it. It happens in our school systems. Man, the teachers see it all the time. They get these little toddlers that they think they're the king of the world, and they come in, and, and they curse you. They throw things at you. It's all because the parent has had it backward. But God's way is let there be standards and let there be consequences for the violation of those standards. Like when you tell a child, uh, don't go into that room. You're not allowed in that room. And that child walks over there closer to the room and sticks their little toe inside the doorway and looks at you to see what you're going to do about it. You know what that is? That's a challenge. <laughs> And your job is not to disappoint them. By that I mean you respond to that challenge and you let them know that you mean what you say. Amen. And so as the consequences, as they face the consequences and as they grow and they show, how many of you agree with what I'm saying here? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and is our culture messed up? Absolutely it is. But as, as children grow and, and, and they prove to them, prove to you that they can be trusted, you lighten up and you lighten up and you lighten up and give them more freedom and give them more responsibility. And then when they reach a point of adulthood, whatever you determine that is, you can step aside and pray. I, I will say this. It is a joy to watch your children grow into adulthood and watch them live as adults, mature adults on their own. Anybody with me on that? You know what I'm talking about. So children, obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. I didn't put this in your outline, but Proverbs chapter 8, verse 9, it says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Uh, kids, respect your mom. Respect, love your mom and dad. Respect your, your mom. Uh, think about all the things that, that your mom has done for you. I, I made a list of some of the things here. Let me just quickly run through this. For nine months, she carried you in her womb. I'm no expert on that, but I have a feeling that for much of that time, it was not a very pleasant experience. I also know that uh, um, you, in, during that time, you made her feel uncomfortable, made her feel uh, uh, unattractive. And she never could get away from you for that time. And whenever you moved, she was aware of that. And then came that moment of birth when there was some fear that struck her spirit. But then she walked through literally the valley of the shadow of death where sometimes complications occur for one or both parties there. She was afraid, but she was willing to bear that. And, and many of them say, you know, I'm willing to do that again. Tell me how much your mother loves you. And so for months after you were born, you know, an infant's, an infant's is pretty demanding. You know, ever notice that? I mean, they don't, they're, they're the least considerate people on the planet. Three o'clock in the morning, they're hungry. What do they do? They wake the whole household up. They, they don't care. I mean, they're hungry. Sally and I had a deal when uh, our kids were, were born. I, maybe I told you this or not, but when uh, our, our Brian, our firstborn, when he was born, we just had a deal. She was a stay-at-home mom at that point. And she said, I'll tell you what, bud, you know, during the night when they wake up, I'll go ahead and get up and I'll take care of them. Just when you get up in the morning and I'm really sleepy, don't, don't wake me up. Just you go on to work and do your thing and then come on home and we'll be a family together. But I'll take care of them during the night. Now, when number, child number two came along, he was a total different being. He wasn't quite as compliant as number one. And so during the night, whenever, you know, she got up to try to take care of them, uh, number two, he just, he was, he was a fighter. And one night she came into the bedroom and she turned on the light. She said, okay, deal's off. <laughs> right now, I could go in that room, pick him up and throw him out the window and I feel good about it. <laughs> so we had to do some renegotiating. 
you know, all, all of that. But hey, you know, babies, they, they got their own time schedule, they have their own time, time frame. And, and when, when you're sick and when you need changing, I mean, babies don't think, I wonder if it's okay for her to change me now. Okay, yeah, I'll go ahead and fill the diaper so it's, it's convenient for her. No, I mean, they, they don't do that. They do it at their own time schedule. And then as you got older, I mean, she taught you how to tie your shoes, how to hold a spoon, how to eat, how to pick up your toys, how to be potty trained, the alphabet, and on and on and on and on and on. And then that day finally came when you went off to school. And deep down inside, she wept. My baby is growing up. My baby is growing up. My baby has gone away. And at the end of the day, you came back home and everything was okay. And then time goes on, and I'll, I'll just wrap it up here with this. And, and, I, and I understood this, I uh, found this number this week, this was searching. You know what the average cost of raising a child in, in our country is? And I know certain areas is different than others, but the average cost of raising a child from birth to age 17. <coughs> this does not include college. But the number that I, I found, and I found in several sources, was $292,000 to raise a child from birth to age 17. And the kids are thinking, I'll take the cash. <laughs> and in some cases, mom and dad might say, I wish I had it back. And, uh, but that, 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 that's, a, that's a lot of money. And that doesn't include the college. So don't tell me your mom and dad have not sacrificed for you. They have. And uh, our, our mothers have done so much for us. And women, thank you for what you do in your home. Thanks for what you have done in your home. Thank you for being the mothers and the women that, that you are. So, some basics on building a solid family. That's very simple. Wives, submit to your husbands as to is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Remember, love her enough to give yourself for her. Don't be harsh. And children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord and the dads talking about the kids. Don't embitter them. You know, don't be harsh at all. You know this, and there is more, there is one who loves you more than mom and dad ever did and ever could. And that's our Heavenly Father. Amen. And he loved us enough to give himself for us, that for us, by giving ourselves back to him and following his way, we have an abundant life that starts now and continues on forever and ever. Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful for uh, this passage today as we've talked about a very, very, very important topic, the home. Thank you for creating the home. And Father, thank you for giving us the guidelines on how to build the home. Thank you for giving us Christ, who's given us life here and life evermore. May we take hold of him by faith and follow him with our whole being. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> that was right. That was a good one. <laughs> I wish you'd have been in here. She might have learned. She might have heard you step on your own toes. <laughs> I remember when Donna and I were dating, and he was talking about listening, touching. But the listening part, when we were dating, I would drive right down the road here, uh, what we call midway, where you turn into cell loop, you know, whatever, because there was a payphone back there side of the road and it wasn't long distance so I put in a quarter and just stay on my forever. But we had seen each other at school that day. I'd go down there every night, drive that phone loop and we would talk for hours. And now I can't think of nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> she she likes to talk. And I don't know Say no way. <laughs> <laughs> and I like to be quiet. So I'm old. We talked about 49 and a half years ago, but we don't talk that much now. So that that sort of chastises me, everybody. I 
be talking to my wife a little more. Just sit down, look her straight in the eye, and talk to her. I don't know how that worked out. We're going to stand and we're going to sing uh, 230. I'll sing later. <laughs>